So WeTech, which is Women in Technology, is a nonprofit that aims to educate, inspire, and empower Filipino youth to break gender barriers and use technology to make a difference in society. So as of 2019, we have been able to impact over 1,100 students in the Philippines through our annual Women in Tech conference. Coming up on Tech Talks today, we're talking to Audrey, who founded WeTech when she was just 15 years old because she felt that she needed to make a difference. And when you feel like that, why wait? This is Tech Talks, your twice weekly technology podcast featuring interviews with leaders from across the industry and sharing a bit of technology news. Enjoy the show. Joining me on today's show, I've got Courtney and Haley. How are you both this lovely Monday morning? I know it's going out on Tuesday, but we are recording on Monday. Does it? Did it feel like a weekend? Oh, actually, I think it did. It, yeah. Yeah. The first, the first, the next one's not going to. But yeah, this weekend did. Yeah. I made a, a yeah conscious kind of decision to do absolutely nothing work orientated, which is not what like normally if I've been in the office I might do one or two things on Saturday morning, but I was like, nah, no bleeding. Got to be kind of otherwise you're here all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I put my phone away at five o'clock on Friday and just put it in with my laptop bag and shut my laptop bag. And I was like, that's me out. Yeah. That's what did you get it. up to? Because Hayley, you, you were going to go to the pub, right? Yeah, yeah, I was, but I didn't. I went to the park well, instead. But well, yeah, the you couldn't have gone so to the pub. busy. No, I know. Yeah. Well, I'm sure some of them were rebelling, but I know that I wouldn't be found there. Don't Which look at me like that. I wouldn't. <laughs> Which which park did you go to? Uh, Moats Park in Maidstone. Ah, that's yeah. near me. Yeah, and there were so many people there. I was like, oh, we'll go there. There'll be no one there. Um, literally, Ramo. Yeah. Did you keep your distance? Yeah. It's really weird at the minute. Bicycle. Go on, no, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, I went on a bike ride yesterday. There were so many people there that they've actually closed the park. Really? They've shut it off. I went there, I went on another bike ride at my lunch break. And they've actually cornered it off. Is is it? Are you finding that you're doing more family? Because it was a bike ride with your brother at the weekend, right? Yeah, I then went again with my stepdad and my brother. I think families are doing more, which is kind of nice. But yeah, yeah, I've got younger this... siblings. I don't want them to be on their iPads and iPhones and everything. Like that. So we just, I'm trying more to get my sister out. Like I went on the trampoline with her and started doing some cheerleading. And then with my brother, I took him out for a bike ride. I just don't want them sat on their iPads. I do feel like you walk past someone and you're kind of giving people a really weird wide berth, which feels a bit weird, but at the same time, people are being more friendly. <laughs> it's odd. You're smiling at people, but you're like... <laughs> I'm not going to breathe your air. <laughs> yeah, absolutely that. <laughs> um, thinking of younger siblings, uh, how, old are your, how old are your brothers and sisters? 12 and 10. I had to think about that then. Courtney, do you reckon your siblings in a couple of years are going to build uh, an international movement for young people to change STEM? <laughs> Probably not. Um, no, my my brother loves technology. Uh, my sister loves TikTok. Um, and probably that's about it. But no, I can't see them doing, doing no. Our okay. guest today, Audrey, um, yeah, at the age of 15, decided that uh, she needed to tackle the gender bias in technology as all 15-year-olds do. And, uh, well, we'll hand over the interview now so you can hear what she actually did and how she went about it. Audrey, I was lucky enough to meet you uh, at, in Lisbon, actually, uh, for the Women in Tech Global Summit, uh, where you were nominated. I can't remember. Oh, forgive me now. This is really bad, considering I hosted the ceremony, but I can't remember if you won the award or not. But amazing that you were nominated nonetheless. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. It was for the Aspiring Teen Award and I yes. was nominated. Yes. Which is incredible because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflection of the work that you've done both as a public speaker, but as a, as a founder of uh, Women in Technology, which is uh, what's well, I'll let you explain what, what is Women <laughs> in Technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so WeTech, which is Women in Technology, is a nonprofit that aims to educate, inspire, and empower Filipino youth to break gender barriers and use technology to make a difference in society. I started WeTech when I was 15, so I was in 10th grade, and, and I just noticed really, and I felt firsthand the impacts of the lack of representation, lack of women of color in technology, and I wanted to really do something about it. So as of 2019, 
we have been able to impact over 1,100 students in the Philippines through our annual Women in Tech Conference and Women in Tech Teach program, where we go to different underprivileged communities in the Philippines that don't get access to tech. And we try to bring in introductory CS courses and how to use um, softwares like Microsoft Office, for instance. Look, this might sound like a really stupid question, but as a 15-year-old, how do you go and build the credibility to be able to put on conferences to do the work that you've done? That's a really good question because that's it really hits one thing that really hindered me from starting WeTech in the beginning or something that really intimidated me, which was the age factor. Um, I'm not saying that when I was 15, I woke up and I thought, oh, let's start a nonprofit. It was really just me wanting to do something about an issue that impacts me and so many young people from my generation. And when I really saw firsthand the effects that the lack of women in technology brought about in my community, for instance, there were girls that I talked to at tech conferences, at tech events that told me about the sexist remarks being thrown at them, talking about how Personally, I've experienced this going to hackathons where none of the speakers, judges, and mentors were women. And I just used that energy, that frustration that I had when I experienced these things and heard stories about others experiencing these things. And I thought, okay, let's do something about it. I think I was very tired of this mentality that I had to wait until I graduated high school, went to a good college, worked a couple of years um, before starting to think about making a difference. And I just got that energy looked around and thought, okay, what resources do I have? And immediately I thought of social media and how I could learn so much and find these women in tech mentors via social media that I didn't have in my um, community. And like that's how I really just started. Like, it wasn't me thinking, okay, let's do a nonprofit with conferences, with outreaches. It was really me going online, learning as much as possible about the gender gap and looking up people on LinkedIn that could then become my mentors and then help me in this process of thinking, how do we tackle the gender gap in tech? Now, look, I, I've ran events, uh, not not particularly large events, but I've run events nonetheless via the podcast, and it could be confusing to know where to go, who to ask for help, etc. And I'm 35 now, and you would imagine would have lots of ability to kind of pull on people to help you. Uh, at that age, What what? who were you turning to? Was it teachers? Was it parents? You mentioned their mentors that you've reached out through social. How did you pull on people and get their time to help you put that together? Because there's no way that you can do that solely on your own. Definitely. It's planning the first women in tech conference for students and by students in the Philippines was a task that I definitely could not have done alone. And in my immediate community, I did not experience a lot of support in entering technology. So I had I knew I had to go online. I had to go outside of my bubble to really find these mentors because a big reason about why I started WeTech in the first place was because when I told teachers, um, peers about my interest in tech, a lot of them said to me, oh, are you sure you're going to be the only girl there? And the teacher even said to me that she didn't think that I would be a good fit and that maybe I should go for something in the humanities instead. So from the beginning, I was already thinking, okay, who else can I go to? And my parents, like, I love them to bits, but they're both former bankers. So they had next to no experience about tech or organizing conferences dealing with technology so to find those or to really launch that project I knew that I had to go outside my bubble and that was where I really leveraged events um, that I found actually via Facebook via LinkedIn here in the Philippines and apps like Meetup for instance told me about the different mixers that were open and I just go through those and I look for the mixers that didn't have an age requirement or the ones that were in any it was open to all and I'd go in there and I'd typically be the only teenage girl at these mixers and I just approach people start conversations and later on I'd kind of elevator pitch what we were doing at WeTech and one thing led to the other and that was how we were able to get speakers, workshop mentors, and a funny story about how we got our event venue for the first Women in Tech conference back in 2018 was that I was initially interviewing 
the one of the branch managers of Accenture here in the Philippines. And when I was asking her about her story and about how what we're doing in WeTech really came about from just experiencing a lack of a support system in tech, she then asked how she could help. And when I told her that we were really struggling to find an event venue because none of the other event venues we reached out to wanted to work with students or were very, very unwilling to take a chance in this very young nonprofit at that time. She, this branch manager, Miss Ambetiero, told us that she'd give Accenture's client visitor center to us for free. And that was such a big help because this was a really established tech company taking a chance on an organization that was less than a year old at that time. And that only was possible because I reached out and I was, you know, just willing to ask and share the WeTech story. So that was how we got our start really back in 2017, 2018. Amazing. I mean, just out of interest, listening to you there, why do you think your teacher told you you wouldn't be a good fit and you should study humanities? Ooh, so that's something that I thought about a lot when I was, when I heard that at 14, around 14 years old. And in the Philippines, only 18% of startups are founded by women, according to the Philippine Startup Survey. And I didn't really know it at that time, but a lot of the pushback I I felt from the tech industry was also very much rooted in the cultural norms here in the Philippines. And that um, here, when you say that you want to go into STEM, it's typically that you want to be a nurse, doctor, or an engineer. Tech back in 2016 really wasn't something that a lot of Filipino students, at least in my school, considered, and not and much less girls considered. In my grade at that time, only one other girl wanted to go into STEM, and she wanted to be a doctor. So it was very different from what I wanted to do in tech. And the guys that wanted to take up computer science in my grade, around two or three of them, wanted to go into video game development. So, Look, this, this, this will highlight my ignorance, okay, for Southeast Asia. But you think of Southeast Asia, you think of maybe somewhere like South Korea, you think of even Vietnam, you think of tiger economies, you think of countries that are very on the front foot around technology. So it's quite surprising to hear you say, just as a general rule, in, in the Philippines, tech isn't thought of. Why is that? Ooh, I think a very large factor is that is that our tech scene gets very much overshadowed, I think, by our neighbors. So Hong Kong, Singapore, you have these really booming tech scenes. You have these startups coming from there that are making headlines. Whereas in the Philippines, tech isn't something that gets talked about as much. And I think it's because not only is it a career path that a lot of very traditional parents don't support and that, we think here in the Philippines, at least, I was raised to believe that a successful job was being an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. And up until today, I still have friends that who have, whose parents tell them, oh, like, what is tech anyway? What are these startups? Just go into a reliable job or a stable job. Like these cultural factors, I think, very much hinder the tech scene from growing. Um, and I think it also has to deal with the fact that in our education system to begin with, technology isn't in it. Like you're not required to take computer science at any point. And many and the only way to get a computer science um, education in a public school here in the Philippines is to go to a science high school. And typically those are very, very competitive to get into with an entrance test and all that. So Couple that with the lack of infrastructure and that many schools here in the Philippines have don't have computer labs, don't have Wi-Fi access. There are so many times where at WeTech we want to bring CS education to a public school and we find that there's so many different barriers. Like they don't have a computer lab and they don't have the Wi-Fi that it would take for us to launch these intro CS classes. Like these are things that when you combine that with culture, really hinder the Philippine startup scene, the tech scene from growing. So next year, you are off to Stanford. Uh, you're studying a degree um, in science, technology, and society. Given everything that you've done up to this point, what's made you choose that particular degree course? 
So STS, Science, Tech, and Society, is a course that I stumbled upon when I was looking at the list of majors in Stanford. And I think to rewind a bit, I knew that I wanted to do something in tech um, when we tech was really picking up and when, for instance, I was be- I was going to these mixers, I was speaking to these professionals in tech, and I really knew then that this is such a promising field that I wanted to be a part of. But when I took my first CS class in junior year of high school, grade 11, I knew that I didn't, the, or the, I knew that the thing that excited me the most about tech wasn't the CS component specifically. It was talking about how CS, how technology as a whole affects our world and how we affect technology. I say this because one day in CS class in particular, we were talking about the ethics of getting, of an app getting a, the location of its user. So it was a, a sample exam question. And I remember my teacher told me that he'd never seen me so engaged in class because we I spent so much time and I showed a lot of energy in discussing the pros and cons of that, you know, that ethical decision. And I found that when I went online, I naturally gravitated to articles about, say, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, about how computer science education could help different countries leverage their startup scenes. I found that when I applied the technical aspect of what I learned in CSS into real world applications, that was when I got, I would like lose myself in talking about it for hours. So I think overall, I do super respect to those people that can code for hours on end and are amazing programmers. But to me, it's how can questions like how can tech be used for social good? How can we develop apps and websites that solve world issues? Like those are the questions that excite me, that really get me going. And when I saw in the Stanford SDS website that those were the big questions that they were also talking about, the ethical implications of technology, how to use tech for good, I knew that that was the course for me. I mean, obviously, with everything that's going on in the world at the minute, technology is being offered as a solution that might help. So if we think about COVID-19 in particular, I was watching the news last night and they were talking about big data and an app that can be used and and the Chinese have used to kind of say, right, if if one person has an infection, then we can track who they've had social interactions with and you can add an AI element to it, etc. Obviously, technology can be applied to so many different avenues of life, yet there is that slight drawback around privacy and and how it encroaches on individuals' rights. What do you think the balance may be how do you kind of see the world through the eyes of what are you you're now 18 yes. um is where is the balance going to be in the future because technology is going to continue to encroach and i suppose it's making sure that it doesn't cross a line yeah tech is definitely a double edged sword like as much as i talk about tech and how much i love it and its importance in this day and age like there are there is really a dark side of technology and i think that it all goes back to starting conversations about how to use it responsibly and talking about, you know, yes, the ethics of it, or simply just questioning how technology is being used on a day-to-day basis as well. One thing that really, I mean, I'm not going to claim that I know like how tech is going to develop and how it's going to impact the world in the next five to 10 years, because You know, I'm 18 and I'm just, I'm talking from the perspective that I have here for the work that I've done. But I can definitely say that in the Philippines, at least, tech is something that can help really empower communities. And I say this because as an organization, we've gone to different marginalized areas wherein tech has previously never been heard of before. Like when you say programming, and we've done this in a, we've done a workshop in a, public school in the southern part of the Philippines that was bombed in 2017 due to suspected terrorists. So the kids there were living in, they they were living apart from outside of the city that was bombed. And 
when we asked them about their knowledge of technology and what programming is, they just said that, oh, it's a thing we type really fast. But to them, when we explained like, oh, what Facebook, Instagram, these social media sites that you use on a day-to-day basis, like those are made using tech, using programming languages. You see kind of these possibilities open up in front of them. You see the excitement as they ask more questions about what they can do using this programming language, what they can create. And I'm a firm believer in that to create solutions, tech solutions to different community problems, you need somebody that's experiencing the problem or you need somebody that's close to the community. And the best way to solve these Philippine-specific problems is to empower these youth, these people that experience these issues with the tools to create the solutions. So I guess long story short, I'd say that I'm quite positive about the application of, of technology, but I also think that there should be more regulation that comes with it and that when we start these conversations, we get more people really actively involved and aware about how tech is being used on a regular basis. And that's including everybody, regardless of what socioeconomic class they're in. Look, it's a really positive message and I fully appreciate your time taking time this evening because whilst it's what midday in London, it is not midday, it's about eight o'clock in the evening over in Manila, right? Oh, yes, it's 8 on 27, but no problem. Right. <laughs> so, look, I thank, thank you very much for taking the time to chat to us. And good luck next year in the US. Thank you so much, David. Please let me know if ever you find yourself in the Stanford or San Francisco area. <laughs> there was a, Right, I was listening back to this, and there was a line in it that kind of stood out, which was, tired of the mentality that I had to wait to make a difference, which... Kind of was like, wow, you were not in the same headspace as me when I was in my mid-teens. And me, wow. I was literally not thinking that sort of thing. Uh, I'm amazed, to be honest with you. Their way of life and their culture must be so different to what ours is because that doesn't even come into perspective until, I mean, <laughs> like last year for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, I'm joking. Um but yeah, no, I wasn't thinking about this until I was physically at work. So when I was at school, I was just looking to leave and get 18 and be able to go down the local bar. Yeah. I was just focused on going to university, but not to do a degree like she's going to Stanford. I just wanted to go to university to, don't tell my parents this, but just have fun. Yeah. Yes, to go on, say it. Yeah, just go out and, you know, live <laughs> uni, typical uni life. Well, I suppose it's like the idea that she was like, oh, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to wait or have the mentality that I had to wait to make a difference. Like when I was That's insane. 14, 15, I was worried about school to a degree because I was worried about what my parents would say. And I was worried about what my immediate friends may or may not think and whether or not the few girls that I fancied might like me or not. But beyond that, that was kind of the limit of my world. The yeah, idea that I... Yeah, the idea that I, I I should try and change society. No, I know. <laughs> it's like a really young girl, like really trying to make a difference and be like a role model. And I'm not she's, sure. Yeah, she's getting herself out there. Like this is something she really cares about. And this is like a smart head and shoulders. Oh, no. Oh, head sh- a smart head on her shoulders. <laughs> I thought you were promoting the um, shampoo brand then. Maybe, and, maybe you've, you've and got... And a very good heart, must I say. You're getting backhanders now, you're kind of getting subtle product placement into the podcast. Um, <laughs> you know, I really liked my, one quote that she, she said was, um, she really wants to empower the youth in the Philippines. She is mm. still the youth in the Philippines. But, yeah. And she's already thinking, she's already thinking ahead to to all the the people younger than her and even people probably her peers I just thought how can someone already be in that leadership level Mm. and like like I said like be an inspiration when she hasn't even finished or she's just finished school well I I, it's not in the main interview but on the sneak peek that we released the day before I asked her about how you build a social following because she's obviously done it really well and she's put these events on I was like you know how do you how do you effectively do that she said oh you know I I have to think about when I'm talking to 13 and 14 year olds, what, what, what motivated me when I was 13 and 14 years old, like that level of awareness at the age of 18, at the age of probably 15, when she started, this is just nuts and makes me feel so fucking useless. It's untrue. (laughs) 
But it's brilliant. I'm giggling. I'm just giggling to myself because I, I'm thinking, what was I thinking when I was younger? She actually is smarter than all three of us now. Yeah. 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 She's more aware uh, about <laughs> everything going on. But how tragic at the same time, like, let's not skirt over the point that when she talks to teachers, her peers, she even said, like, I love my mum and dad, but yeah. they're from a completely different world. You know, are you sure you'll be the only girl there when talking about technology? Like, yeah, she's she's probably smarter than the three of us, but she's probably more aware and smarter than her educators and her immediate kind of adult peers in her life. And it's just incredible that then she thought, these people aren't giving me the right advice, so therefore I'm going to go online and find mentors that can help me. And I'm going to go and find out and arm myself with the knowledge that I need to, regardless of what my teachers or parents might say. Yeah, I know. And then even this takes us back to the the other podcast we did where the people in her country are believe that being a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse is like being seen as successful, but actually... There's such a, a bigger world out there around technology that they just haven't explored yet. And she mm. wants to bring that to life with the younger kids there. Like, that's amazing. What what a character. Literally have in- inspiration. Yeah. Out of interest, if you two remember what it was like to be 15 years old, were you aware of sexist remarks? Like, she talks about the fact that sexist remarks were being made and she wanted to do something about it. Like, again, at that age, I just don't think I had that... No. After after university, um, well, obviously starting work is the only time that I've realised kind of sexism in the workplace and, and be more aware about what's going on. Mm. But that's at 21 years old, not at 15. At 15, I probably thought, oh, that was a rude word. Ha ha, that's funny. I'm going to say that again. Yeah, and not actually understanding what they were saying. But do you know what I mean? Like, I was probably a naive, stupid kid at 15. Well, no, but kids are, generally. (laughs) I I definitely was, not going to (laughs) lie. But I think... I didn't I know what day what, of the week it was. <laughs> well, to be fair, at the minute. Yeah, I'm beginning to lose track of what day of the week it is. Uh, no, but um, yeah, I, I just think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant example to anyone who is that age and who cares about something passionately that there is this resource. You know, she said social. A lot of people knock social media, but here's a young person who went, uh, right, I'm going to use it as a resource. I'm going to reach out to people. I'm going to be willing to share and and to talk about what I do and reach out to people and talk about it. And because of that, she's a TEDx speaker. She's spoken to the UN. She's going to Stanford. She's been nominated and won numerous different awards. She's been interviewed in Esquire. It's just like, Christ, you, you don't need lots of money. You don't need even to have support necessarily at home. If you've got got the bit between your teeth and you care about something the resources are there for anyone to to do something important that that obviously makes a difference and matters yeah and the philippines is a it's quite a small country when you look at like southeast asia i remember looking at the map when i i like when i wanted to travel and to think that you don't even need to be in america or in england or like you don't need to be close to these places you can do it Cross, across the world and still yeah. have the same footprint and still manage to get like places like Stanford. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we're all obviously amazed and feel a bit rubbish, Audrey. So thanks for that. <laughs> Can we also make a point that, so she wants to look at tech. I feel like this is such a nice mm-hmm. point. And the reason she's doing it, is she wants to do it for the social good. Like, can she be any more amazing? <laughs> Down to earth. Yeah, and like about sold solve world issues with technology. This is what her passion is. Like that's not an everyday kind of thing. She yeah. is the face of the future. Yeah, I was thinking this. She's obviously a Z, is it a Z gen. Sorry. She's a Z gen, isn't she? Two thousand. She would have been two thousand. Yeah, she's yeah, yeah, she's gen Z. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She is the face of the future. Mm. Yeah. Watch this space. Well, also, I suppose it shows that, you know, someone like Greta Thunberg's obviously been in the news quite a lot for obvious reasons. Um, climate change is obviously top of the agenda, but she is not alone in amongst that there are people who of that age who really can motivate and inspire other people to do more. 
But yes, we'll go to an advert break and when we come back, we'll have a short piece of technology news and uh, that'll round off the, sh- the show for today. Once a month, Tech Talks opens The Tuck Shop, a YouTube tech news roundup, which is kindly carried by Disruptive Live. Disruptive Live is the UK's first and only 24-7 TV channel for the technology industry. Stay up to date with all the latest industry news by following our regular talk shows broadcast live across the Disruptive Live website and social media channels. You can also catch Disruptive Live at some of the largest global technology events, broadcasting from London, Manchester, Singapore, Dubai, and many more. Welcome back to Tech Talks. Today's technology news is partly inspired by um, a bit of uh, radio that I was listening to on my run this morning where they had uh, the open reach head talking about uh, the network speeds that the UK is experiencing with everyone working from home. And also the fact that Disney Plus, who've just launched in the UK, uh, along with Facebook, are the latest companies to reduce their streaming speed. Um Apparently, at nine o'clock at night, there is a massive surge because everyone's streaming loads because no one's going out anymore. So all these companies are reducing their streaming speeds to um, cater for it. And also, I thought I'd mention it because, you know, Disney Plus have just launched. And are either of you going to subscribe to Disney Plus? No, no but Ali would. Yeah, no. Would. Why not? All the Disney films that I'd want to watch uh, on Netflix or I've already watched them. Oh, interesting. I thought, yeah, I was, I, I would assume that Disney Plus probably would trump Amazon, certainly. I'm actually, if if it wasn't for the delivery, I would, I'd never look at Amazon Prime Video. Never. Yeah. I've got to pay it's a for last it. resort. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, anyway, Facebook, Disney are joining um, Netflix, Amazon, Apple and YouTube and reducing streaming video quality in order to lighten the load on the internet in Europe as more people start working and learning remotely in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Disney will also delay the release of Disney Plus streaming service in France, poor French people, in accordance with government requests. So, to be perfectly honest... I have realised it's slower. It is... I think it's slower now, today. Today has been a lot slower. I mean... I was going to say, and just has anyone else noticed that phones in general, I can't call anyone. I have to call him about five times before it actually goes through. I think really? he's just ignoring you. No, it's going like not not working, like the network. So it's because lots of people are working from home, right? Yeah, I have heard the providers are kind of, I've, I've heard about Vodafone and which I'm on. Um, Is that similar? More people using it. I guess so. Well, the cellular net- networks, if people are streaming stuff over over the mobile network, although you'd imagine they'd be using their Wi-Fi if they were at home, but I don't know, maybe they're not switching onto the Wi-Fi. I mean, there is this point, isn't there, that people are going to be using massive amounts of data at home on their home internet. Are they going to say, are we going to turn around at the end and go, hang on a minute, I've, got, I've been clobbered with a massive bill. You know, come on work, stump up. Do people have that though? Is there actually a, because I've got my own Wi-Fi and I think I've got unlimited I think I, I assume I have, but I would also hazard a guess that not everybody has that, and certainly not everyone has access to the internet. Even let's make, not make the naive assumption that actually the internet is something that everybody has. Mm, very I, true. Uh, yeah, I'm quite naive. I, I do think that everyone can work from home. Just yeah, I never really think that people haven't actually got. I oh, know that's that's a really bad. That's really bad, isn't it? I, I yeah, I just always I just assumed that everyone probably did have internet nowadays. Because you can get it for so cheap. You can get it for like £5 a month. Mm. Yeah, mm. true. So it just, I mean, yeah. I'm actually surprised that the companies are coming. I mean, it's a good thing that they're coming out and they're all doing this and it's bilateral agreement. They're all reducing their speed. But it's one of those things that I just would have assumed that you kind of accept that if, if everyone's at home and no one can go out to the pub and no one can go out to restaurants or theatres, the internet's probably going to be a bit slower. And what 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 can the provider do? The fact that Netflix and so on are voluntarily reducing their speeds to try and lighten the load, it's it's quite a nice thing. But I, yeah. I reckon they probably could have gotten away with it if they didn't want if they if they weren't that fussed. They they probably could have just been like, well, you know, demand's high. What can we do about it? It's yeah. good for them, I guess so. It's a good bit of PR. Yeah, yeah good publicity. But I think they could have equally. I, I don't think anyone would have switched off net, Netflix if every now and then there was a bit of buffering issues or the streaming quality wasn't as good, because you would have gone, oh well, everyone's at home. What can they do? I would just assume that obviously it's a lower. You, you, if your uh, movie was buffering, 
you you would just assume that everyone's on it. Oh, that's annoying. But you wouldn't then attack blame them. Media, like, oh, I can't believe you've done this. Yeah, maybe we're just moving to a slightly nicer world. Maybe, maybe for six months and then watch it go back. <laughs> <laughs> Ten times worse. <laughs> right. Well, look. Thank you both for joining me today and uh, breaking up your Monday. I know you're both busy. Um, obviously, this is going out on Tuesday, so everyone else we're hoping that you have a lovely week and we will be back on friday